Sometimes bacterial infections don't just occur in an individual animal or person. And in these cases, we oftentimes need to determine the source of the infection to protect other members of the group. This is where molecular epidemiological techniques are really important. As you can see from this definition here, molecular epidemiology is really just a branch of epidemiology that focuses on, focuses on the distribution of potentially pathogenic organisms using molecular techniques, so looking at uh, genetic associations between organisms. So essentially what we're looking at is where and how are people or animals getting sick, um, and how are these pathogens transmitting? What's the source of the organisms, and how can it be stopped? We're going to start off today's lecture by talking about a case. So back in the spring of 2017, um, I had a chance to work with Dr. Jenny Nichols, um, who is actually a classmate of mine, and at the time was working as uh, the poultry extension veterinarian here at the University of Saskatchewan. Jenny was working with a broiler breeder flock, which had seen an increase in the mortality rate. Um, there were a number of 41-week-old broiler breeders, um, 10 of them that had been submitted uh, to the Poultry Extension Division for necropsy and cultures. In this figure here, what you can see is the average weekly mortality in this particular uh, facility. So we have the age in weeks of the birds and the percent mortality on a weekly basis. Now, what you can see here is the normal mortality, so 0.1 to 0.2% per week is sort of within the expected range. And what this particular flock was experiencing was a much elevated rate. So here you can see in red, house 3 was getting up around 1%, and house 2 was also somewhat elevated. As I said, diagnostic investigations were done on birds from this flock, and E. coli was isolated on bone marrow swabs that were submitted for culture. Now, what was really interesting and maybe a little bit surprising is that therapy with tetracycline was not successful. Antimicrobial susceptibility testing revealed really a pretty wimpy E. coli for the most part. You can see that it was in fact susceptible to tetracycline. And so this is where Jenny and I started to have a conversation. As a poultry vet, she wanted input from a microbiologist on why these birds were still dying despite having an infection with an organism that should have been susceptible to the drug that it was being treated with. Looking at the birds on necropsy was a really important part of this investigation, and what's noted here is that there were petechial hemorrhages all over the internal organs. So here you can see on the ovary there's these petechiations, as well as on the heart, which is indicative of sepsis. However, the inside of the bird isn't where all of the interesting findings were limited to, and when the birds were sort of grossly examined, all of these little black flecks could be seen all over the surface of the animals. There were tremendous numbers of these little specks, and when they were looked at a little bit more closely, as you can see in this tube here or microscopically, these turned out to be mites. These mites were identified within the Department of Veterinary Microbiology based on specific anatomical structures that were present. And I understand that within this red circle um, is an anatomical structure that's very characteristic um, of the mites. But this didn't really explain the mortality. An infestation of ectoparasites isn't typically a great reason for birds to be dying. Serological testing ruled out a number of immunosuppressive and uh, other infectious diseases, infectious bursal disease virus and Newcastle disease virus, as well as mycoplasma species. So we really didn't have a good explanation of what was going on. The more Jenny and I talked about this, we sort of came back to the parasites and uh, tried to think about what could possibly be going on here uh, that would lead to the increased mortality events that were seen. Interestingly, there had recently been a change in the regulation of antiparasitic agents in Canada, um, and the use of carbamates had been terminated in 2016, so just one year prior. In this particular facility, a carbamate was being used prior to this, and once it was terminated, um, no alternative was sourced. The next step was to begin treatment with an organophosphate, and this actually resulted in a slight decrease in mortality of the birds. Jenny did some more investigation um, and found that there was a product called Fleurlaner, um, or Exolt is the, the brand name, 
which at the time was not actually available in Canada, and I believe it still isn't. Um, she obtained what's called an emergency drug release to use this on sort of a one-time basis within this particular facility. The product was applied to the birds according to the label indication, and there was a massive die-off of mites. Um, it was actually so pronounced that two employees of the barn were tasked with cleaning dead mites and blood off of the eggs. So it was very, very, very effective in this case. Not only was it effective in killing the mites, but a coincident reduction in mortality was also seen. So here's an extension of that same figure we saw before with the weekly mortality rates. Uh, the mortality in house three peaked at over 2% on a weekly basis and house two over 1.5%. Uh, with application of this new drug, mortality rates dove back into the normal range. So what happened here? This was highly unusual. Well, as a bacteriologist and a poultry veterinarian, we talked a lot about what might be going on, and we wondered if the mites and E. coli might be kind of playing together. Was there some sort of synergistic relationship going on? And so what we did was initiated a molecular epidemiological investigation to determine if we could find similar E. coli on and in the mites as we were seeing in affected birds. So we started by collecting a large number of samples, um, swabs from affected birds and diagnostic isolates, cloacal swabs from healthy birds, environmental samples, samples of the water lines, and also tubes of mites. We crushed them up and cultured them. We grew E. coli from all of these different sources, and then we compared them to each other using a molecular epidemiological technique called pulse field gel electrophoresis. What you can see in this image here are the DNA banding patterns uh, that we generated by pulse field gel electrophoresis. You can see that they look like barcodes. And what immediately stood out to us is the isolates grown from the dead birds, circled in red here, had exactly the same banding pattern as those isolates which were grown from mites, but a different banding pattern than those E. coli which were grown from either the environment or healthy birds. And so our final conclusion is that we had an E. coli septicemia that was secondary to parasitism. So we had this massive infestation of birds, which led to immunosuppression and hematogenous spread of E. coli following invasion through the mite bites. So these ectoparasites were acting as mechanical vectors, physically carrying E. coli from one bird to another, and then allowing it to enter through the bite wounds. So a really unexpected finding and a really fantastic example of just how useful molecular epidemiological techniques can be to identifying the source. We never would have been able to prove that um, the E. coli was coming from the mites without pulse field gel electrophoresis or something similar. Epidemiology and identifying the source of infection goes way back before the development of molecular epidemiological techniques. So this is a, an image of the Broad Street Pump in London in the Soho region, um, and John Snow, a famous um, father of epidemiology who investigated the Soho cholera outbreak in the 1800s and was able to identify this pump, or the original pump, uh, as the likely source of the outbreak. This is an image from John Snow's sort of original notebook, and what you can see here is a map of the Soho area, and each of these little dash marks um, on, on, on the map indicates a case of cholera. What he was able to deduce from this data is that cases of cholera were spatially associated with this pump, and that if this was your closest source of water, you were more likely to get cholera than somebody who received their water from a different source. If you're interested in diving a bit deeper into this story, um, I'd encourage you to take a look at this YouTube link. I'll put a link above, and you can see this data mapped out kind of in real time. So at the time, there were two different water sources in London, the Southwark and Vauxhall Water Company and the Lambeth Water Company. Um, John Snow plotted out the number of houses who were supplied by each and the number of cholera deaths um, associated with each uh, water source. And what he was able to demonstrate is that uh, there were far more deaths from people um, getting their water from the Southwark and Vauxhall Water Company than the other one. 
And today we would use statistical techniques to demonstrate that this is statistically significant and that we have a real problem that is not due to chance associated with this particular source of water. So epidemiology goes all the way back to the 1800s. And I think what John Snow really eloquently demonstrates for us is the importance of identifying the source of a pathogen, even if you don't entirely understand what it is. If you control the source, you can control spread. And that's ultimately our goal. Now, molecular epidemiological techniques are used in a wide variety of settings. So recently, there have been outbreaks of measles in the United States. This is some data from the 2015 uh, measles outbreak that was primarily associated with uh, people that had visited an amusement park in California and then carried that virus with them back to a large number of uh, other states within the country. We saw molecular epidemiological techniques used to track the West African Ebola outbreak from 2013 to 2016. We see molecular epidemiological techniques used extensively for tracking uh, outbreaks of enteric disease. Uh, this is some data from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control looking at salmonella associated with dog treats, so pig ears, which are fed to dogs as a treat, um, have been shown to be a possible source of salmonella. And these cases in either animals or people can be linked up by looking at the genetic relatedness of the strains. We can also see sources of salmonella associated with human treats. This is some data from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, what you can see here is the epidemiological curve, so the number of cases over time. A total of 85 cases were identified over a period of approximately six months. So very, very powerful when you consider that 85 cases across an entire country can be linked to each other using these DNA fingerprinting techniques. I've put a link to a video above where you can see a bit of an explanation from the Public Health Agency of Canada on how they actually do these investigations. And then, of course, I think all of us are familiar with SARS-CoV-2. Not only was DNA sequencing critical in the initial identification of uh, the virus, but also in tracking the development, um, emergence, and dissemination of new variants of SARS-CoV-2. Well, it might be hard to see the utility now, um, as practitioners, you frequently need to do detective work to determine if you're dealing with a disease outbreak or simply some unrelated cases. There's a lot of information that's available to you and that's useful to collect when doing this detective work, um, including some basic epidemiological data. So first of all, are these infections all caused by the same etiology? Do we have a temporal relationship? So are these infections occurring at the same time? When putting together the pieces of the puzzle, I would encourage you to avoid the temptation to draw conclusions about the relatedness of strains based just on susceptibility profiles. And I'll tell you more about why I think that's important in the next couple of slides. So that's the information that you have available to you as part of your sort of routine clinical work. But sometimes more information is required to determine where the infection is coming from. Maybe we have auto-infection, the animal is self-infecting itself, such as the case of a urinary tract infection where the E. coli is commonly coming from the gut. Maybe we have spread from another animal and there's sort of one carrier that's disseminating it out to other susceptible individuals. Or we have a common third source, so something like those pig ears and salmonella. So why do I encourage you to think twice about susceptibility data? Well, it does have some advantages. So for one, it's information you kind of already have or should already have. It's information that you're familiar with and comfortable with. You're routinely doing um, these diagnostic workups and getting culture and susceptibility data from the lab. So it's quick and relatively cheap. The disadvantage of susceptibility data is that resistance phenotypes are very poorly predictive of relatedness. Um, Exceptions would be things like highly unusual phenotypes, which are really unlikely to occur independently by chance. So things like vancomycin-resistant staphylococci, carbapenem-resistant enterobacteriales, things like that. Really, really unusual things. You might have an index of suspicion that perhaps those are, in, are linked to each other. Why is this the case? So why are these so poorly predictive? Well, common things occur commonly. So regionally, within a given geographic area, 
unrelated organisms tend to have similar susceptibility profiles. We have a homogenizing effect of local antimicrobial use. We have horizontal gene transfer. And so bacteria within Saskatoon, for instance, E. coli causing UTIs in dogs, all tend to look quite similar to each other. When it comes to horizontal gene transfer, I think it's really important to recognize that unrelated organisms can have exactly the same resistance phenotype. So in this cartoon here, we have a multi-drug resistant E. coli on the left. It has this plasmid with genes conferring resistance to tetracycline, ampicillin, trimethoprim, and ciprofloxacin. On the right, we have an entirely unrelated, fully susceptible E. coli. So what happens? What does horizontal gene transfer look like? Well, this plasmid containing our TET, BLA, DFR, and QNR can be transferred from the multidrug resistant organism to the unrelated susceptible organism through conjugation, transferring resistance, giving you exactly the same phenotype, but they're still unrelated to each other. So the susceptibility profile alone is really not a good predictor of just how closely related these organisms are to each other, which in an epidemiological context means that they're not great predictors of what the source of the organism was. Are they coming from one place or are they really just independent coincident events? So this is where molecular epidemiological techniques come in. They allow us to directly compare the relatedness of isolates and they're based on detecting polymorphisms or differences within the genome. So not just looking at, is there a specific resistance gene present or not, but looking at the DNA, ideally a little bit more holistically. We can do this using two main types of techniques. Uh, epi molecular epidemiological techniques can examine the sequence directly, whether it's looking at specific genes or even the whole genome, which is increasingly done. Or we can look at the sequence of the genome indirectly, either through restriction digestion patterns, PCR, like random amplified uh, polymorphic DNA, or some combination of these techniques. Mm -hmm.